Dr. Miller, hello and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions for you. Uh, the first one is regarding what works in therapy. Uh, yeah. In my own work, in my own experience, I uh, quickly became interested in what works. I wondered what uh, makes us efficient. Um, and I know this is a big area of interest for you too. So it is. I was wondering how did you begin being interested in this? How did uh, your research in this area begin? I think as a young psychologist, I really wanted to know what the right thing to do was with my clients. And when I finished school, I have to say that I didn't feel any more clear about what worked than when I started school, really. I had lots of theories, and I'd learned lots of different methods, but none of it seemed to fit very well, the clients I was working with. And so I took a position with two leading clinicians of the day. It was in Sue Berg and Steve DeShazer, and they worked at the Brief Family Therapy Center and were developing a specific approach to treatment called solution-focused therapy. And I worked there and with them and did research and writing for nearly five years. By the end of my tenure there, I had grown very confident about my skills. I wasn't nervous in the room with clients. I felt like I knew what to do from moment to moment, and many of the clients that I met with said that they had been helped. But that wasn't sufficient, so we invited some researchers in who surveyed our clients, a group of about 250 clients, and they came back and said they had good and bad news. And the good news was that what we did worked. Uh, when we asked what the bad news was, they said it didn't work any better than anything else. And so it was quite a surprise because, of course, we were thinking that what we were developing was quite effective and probably more effective and would take less time than other approaches. And that didn't turn out to be the case. So. The team had a lot of discussion, but eventually split into two parts. Uh, and the younger crew left the Brief Family Therapy Center, and I began exploring this question again, despite my confidence about what was it that really contributed to the outcome of treatment. And that's where my work has continued ever since. Uh, we've uh, had lots of ideas. We explored common factors, looking for the elements among treatment approaches that uh, every approach has in common. We recognized uh, after working in that avenue, that vein, for some time that the common factors really couldn't provide direction for how to do treatment. And that's what therapists want. They really want direction. What should I say and what should I do for a client who presents in this way? So because the common factors are common, you, you can't turn them into a treatment model, otherwise they become another treatment approach. And we had always talked about the common factors being a way that clinicians could borrow from different treatment approaches, but it just didn't hold together logically. And eventually, we decided that uh, we would just recommend that people measure their results, that we weren't exactly sure there was a right way of working, mm -hmm. but what we could tell was whether or not what we were doing with a particular client at a given time mm -hmm. was working. So we developed a couple of simple tools and began measuring the results. It appeared early on at least, that providing clinicians with feedback seemed to improve the outcomes. We also noticed during that time that there were certain clinicians that achieved better outcomes than others. And for probably the last 10 years, that's where I've spent my time. We've been trying to understand why are some clinicians better than others in terms of their effectiveness with the hope that what we learn from them might help the rest of us that were not the top performers. 
that's where I've been for the last uh, for the last about decade. Okay, this brings us to my very next question. Great. In the super shrinks. Yeah. Dr. Miller, what do you know? What do they do that sets them apart? And can we copy them? Can we learn from them? Well, initially, we were really very confused about what led some to be better than others because we were watching what the therapist did in the counseling room. Mm -hmm. We believed somehow that they must be doing something in the moment with their clients that was noticeable and that led to the superior results. And we didn't find anything. And eventually, we decided to abandon the project and I happened I just by chance to come across an article in a magazine while I was flying home from Europe uh, that talked about the work of a man named Anders Ericsson. And Ericsson had been researching for three decades what led to superior performance, not in psychotherapy, but in medicine and in music and in sports. And remarkably, his research suggested that the particular area or domain of expertise didn't matter so much. What mattered was whether or not the people within that domain did several common activities. Uh, those common activities were, number one, they consistently measured their outcomes. They knew how good they were at the moment. And most therapists don't know how good they are and our own research shows that therapists frequently overestimate how effective they are. The second thing clinicians had to do or anyone had to do, any performer within any domain, was get feedback about their performance. In particular about small errors, things that they didn't do right. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece was they needed to do something called deliberate practice, which is conscious repetition. Mm -hmm. They needed to do things over and over again, working hard at improving their performance just a small bit. And we've just published several studies on this, uh, looking at top performing therapists, and we found, for example, that the best therapists simply spend more time engaged in deliberate practice than average therapists. And someone might ask, well, what is it they're practicing? So we can copy it. And this would be, this would be the wrong way of thinking. Okay. You can't practice things that everybody else does. You have to practice your getting better at what you don't do well, okay. which means you have to identify what you don't do well and rehearse that. Okay. So the search for some specific thing that everybody can do that will make them uniformly better is really a, a fool's errand. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. Uh, but we're really hopeful that by helping clinicians uh, measure their outcomes and identify where they uniquely fall short and then practice that they can actually get better at what they're doing. Okay. I was wondering when you say practice, hmm. um, whether this is only about practicing in the session or maybe making, um, I don't know how to say this, make, maybe make-believe sessions or maybe reading yeah. or watching other psychotherapists work? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, well, I can tell you this, that, that I think we had been mistaken by looking in the session mm -hmm. for what the therapists were doing. Mm -hmm. Because in truth, deliberate practice is something you do when you're not seeing clients. It's identifying your errors, reflecting on better ways of working, and then rehearsing them. Whether you do that in your head, mm -hmm whether you do that in role plays or with your supervisor, whether you're reading research articles, the best simply engage in more of it than the rest. It, it's not, it is not that most of us don't practice. We, we do. It's just that the best do it a lot more than us. I see. Okay. That's encouraging. It, really it is. is. It is. It suggests that we can get better. And so I sometimes say 
professional development is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. You, you can't run your way to better outcomes. And most workshops and training really are attempts to sprint to success. <laughs> Uh, and as such, they really are misleading. What we have to do is have a plan for professional development over the course of our careers. I really like the sound of that. Maybe it's just personality, I don't know, but I really like the sound of that. Well, that's interesting that you've mentioned that because uh, there are a lot of investigations going on right now about uh, what are the qualities of people who, who are interested in that message. Because, of course, we're discovering not everyone is. Uh, of course, if I had a choice, if my child were ill, for example, and I had a choice between an average physician and the best, who would I want? So if you adopt the perspective of the recipient of care, I think it puts some pressure on us to at least try to get better. Yeah. S still, you know, we're just beginning to unfold this onion to see uh, what what is it that are the characteristics of people who will engage in the extra effort to be better. Uh huh. So there could be some uh, traits, maybe some some attributes, but I was wondering whether where does talent? Um, figure into things. Is it important? Is it something that's, I don't know, real? Uh, is it important for success to be talented, to have an innate uh, ability to, I don't know? Well, I think we're a long way from understanding if there are innate qualities mm -hmm. that lead to good therapy. Um, and that idea certainly won't help the rest of us <laughs> who are already here mm -hmm. uh, and, in, and in the field. Um, at, at the same time, there are clearly people who enter the field who are more able mm -hmm. at providing the kind of environment that leads to personal change. We know this. Uh, we're looking at data right now about different students and where they start in terms of their ability to foster uh, relationships. Again, whether that's a learned behavior or a response to environmental pressures or genetic, you know, I have no idea. Anders Ericsson would say that the search for heritable, inherited characteristics that would predict superior performance have been uh, uh, very, um, uh, have, have not been successful, really. So I, I'm, I'm inclined not to believe in talent. Um, I think talent is an outcome. It's not an input. Uh, it's not what makes you great. It's what happens when you become great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, my next question might seem a little bit silly because I mm -hmm. kind of know the answer, but I just want to, I need a clarification. Okay. I know much of the research points to the fact that outcome doesn't really depend on uh, method, on yeah. method, yeah. But I was wondering whether for uh, specific problems such as anxiety problems or panic attacks or what have you, depression, I don't know, uh, some models, some techniques are better suited. What What do we know about that? Well, this is a, uh, an area of, I think, considerable controversy. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's just say that there are methods that are better. I would argue that the method cannot be superior to the person using it. Sure. So you have to have a, an apt user. And what we know is that at present, competence and adherence to treatment approaches doesn't predict good outcomes. And when you do direct comparisons uh, between two different models, bona fide models where the both treatments are designed to be helpful mm -hmm. that we don't find much difference. Mm -hmm. There's a new meta-analysis that came out by Tolan recently and our team has been looking at this particular study. Uh, we found uh, arithmetic errors in, in, in the study that uh, once again suggests that the models are equivalent in effect. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is, mm -hmm. 
let's say for social anxiety, which is what the Tolan meta-analysis is about, uh, that's one diagnosis among 350 some in the DSM. And we can't even agree on that. Mm -hmm. Are we going to search for a specific method for all of the 350? It seems unwieldy, especially if you look at the outcomes of average practitioners. When we measure outcomes of practitioners working in the real world with often complex caseloads, clients who have not one problem, but many problems, their outcomes are equivalent, equal, to outcomes obtained in these strange studies that seem to have so much importance in our in our culture at present time. Mm -hmm. So I find the debate a waste of time and money. Okay. And what I want to know is how effective is this practitioner? So instead of evidence-based methods, what we should have is evidence-based practitioners. I like this idea. I, I have never thought about it, but now that you say it, yeah, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay. I wanted to also ask you about uh, the uh, ORS and the SRS. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us more about um, why it's important to use feedback-informed treatment and how does it help us improve? Well, there are two key predictors of outcome mm -hmm. that are easy to measure. One is the client's experience of the quality of the relationship, uh, the alliance it's mm -hmm. been called. And the, the alliance is associated with clients' engagement, and engagement is the number one predictor of outcome. So to us, it made sense. You should probably measure the quality of the relationship. And we were looking for some simple scale that would be applicable to clients from a variety of backgrounds and abilities uh, and develop the SRS. There are many other alliance scales available. The SRS just happens to be one, um, and it's available on my website for free. Um, the second, the second scale, the ORS, is our outcome measure, and mm -hmm. we think it's important to measure the client's experience of progress, since their level of distress is such a strong predictor of how long they stay in care and how effective the treatment's going to be. And so we know that clients, for example, tend to experience improvement if they are going to improve with a particular practitioner earlier rather than later. And this means that we probably need to find out, are they getting better? Are they getting better? And do they experience a good relationship with us? Mm -hmm. If not, if neither of those things are available, it gives the clinician an opportunity to alter the nature of the service, to change things and better accommodate the clients um, and to get a better treatment outcome. So the real reason to measure is that it allows us the opportunity to address problems mm -hmm. earlier rather than later. Great, 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 great. <laughs> okay, one last question, maybe two. Yeah. No, sir. Okay. Um, you're going to be in Bucharest in March. Which yes. Is great. We're very yeah. excited. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah, must too. And uh, we were wondering if you would tell us a little bit more about the workshop. The um, particular workshop uh, that I'll be doing is talking about feedback-informed uh, treatment, I believe. And um, there are two full days, which is quite luxurious. Well, oh, there's only one day what? this time. So uh, it's uh, in, during that time, I'll talk about the evidence base for doing feedback-informed work, mm -hmm. as well as present the particular measures and talk about how to use them and illustrate that process with uh, video examples mm -hmm. uh, from the clients that I've worked with here in America. That's so great. I'm so yeah. excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's, it's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Glad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my last question would be, um, why would uh, the workshop be beneficial for any psychotherapist from any modality? I know you kind of answered this, but maybe... Yeah. Well, 
Um, the, the nice thing about FIT is that it, FIT has no theory of its own. It's not a method for doing treatment. It's a way of checking the quality and the outcome of whatever work that you do. And so we're working with clinicians around the world from a variety of approaches, everything from behavioral to psychodynamic. And practitioners use these measures on an ongoing basis to improve the quality and outcome of care. So it is one thing that can be used regardless of the treatment approach that you use and for which we have nearly 20 randomized clinical trials documenting that it improves outcome, reduces dropouts, and reduces deterioration in care. So I think those would be three good reasons why you'd want to come. I do too. I do too. <laughs> Dr. Miller, thank you. Thank you very much. It's and my I'm pleasure. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in Bucharest in March. So do we. So do we. Thank you. Perfect. You're welcome. Okay, goodbye. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.